Hey folks, this is Aaron Jones with Hi-Fi Buys, your destination in Atlanta for Hi-Fi. I am so excited to have a couple of people join me today. One is Josh Clark, president and owner of Rockport Technologies. Also I have with us is John Zimmer, who is director of sales for Rockport Technologies. I am so happy to be able to be doing this interview. We're doing a launch at the store tonight on the Orion speakers, which sit behind us. I cannot wait for the folks to tell us what they hear out of this room tonight, because it's gonna be rather amazing. Um, if y'all will, I'd like to start off with you and kind of tell the folks a little bit about who you are a little bit and how you got involved in Rockport and sure. you know what your positions and that kind of thing are there. Well, since high school, I've been dreaming about making speakers and I was always, a uh, interest in music and science and audio is just always fascinated me. You know, I'm also a musician, so I uh, studied music and physics in college and had planned to go into speakers right away. So I plan to work in high-end audio, high-end audio specifically, okay. um, to try to push the state of the art. And uh, I got a job with a wonderful company, Transparent Audio, which was based in Maine, where I went to college and wanted to live. Had 22 years there. I uh, thought, you know, I didn't know what it was going to be, but I did uh, sales support and mostly product development support and eventually became product development director there mm. and had a really great career there, basically. A lot, but of, a lot of folks did. Ultimately, yeah. exactly. <laughs> and yeah, no, it's it's a really great company, but I, I wanted to get into the thing that I originally wanted to do. And uh, Rockport Technologies is another main company a really special company um, founded by Andy Payor. Uh, he started Rockport Technologies in 1991, but he was doing all kinds of um, audio work, including with Transparent Audio. Mm -hmm. And I had met him and gained a friendship with him and a working relationship with him uh, starting in, the, in 1998. My approach was to see, hey Andy, you know, you are basically an artist and I wanna see Rockport Technologies carried forward and I wanna learn from a master. You know, I believe in working with an expert, a master, and learning under them. And so my goal is to carry Rockport Technologies forward into the future as a cutting edge loudspeaker company. So what you had was a great background to kind of get involved in it. And then at the same time, to continue I think so. your education through somebody that already has done so many things that you kind of probably would have already Correct. liked to have done. Does that yes. make sense? Yes, and you know, I'm not technically an engineer, but I'm very engineering minded. I can tell it from the time we've spent <laughs> together. And so. I'm, you know, I enjoy designing products and I like collaborating. So when did you take over the company? I know that Andy's still with you as right. far as design, but I know you're also me. helping in that regard too. I, I get that, so I'm trying to kind of just help our folks out there know. Yeah, so 2019, um, so I approached Andy to be a partner, but ultimately we did it as a full buyout. Really, I see it as a partnership. So it was 2019 and we've worked together and this was our first joint product. I'm pointing at the Orion. Um, so we started work on that in 2019 and we don't do things quickly, but we hopefully do them right. And we spent a lot of time developing that product together. Well, we're gonna get into kind of the specialities of that as we kind of get through time. You wanna tell us a little bit about uh, John, your sure. uh, direction yeah. in the company and that kind of thing and where you, where you say things. Sure, you know, in, for me, I start, this store feels kind of like home to me because my first experience in high-end audio was in a store in New York City that I worked for for a number of years. Okay. And it was very much like this. I've always loved music, you know, some people, I think most people like music. Some people are like obsessed with music and it's just your thing, you know? And that was me, I was DJing like, you know, in high school and college. And when I found out about high-end audio and I heard the music that I loved for the first time in this way that I didn't knew existed, my mind was blown. I get, yeah, we have all, I think, you know, it's always funny, you know, when was your first experience? Yeah. <laughs> yep. yeah. So totally. it's, uh, it's great to see that, carry on. Yeah, so, so you know, I, I started that job in New York City. At one point I wanted to be an audio engineer. I thought that'd be the way to tie in you know, my career with, with my passion, but that's how I got exposed to high-end audio. And then I kind of just got sucked into this world. And I know Josh from those days because we sold transparent audio cable at that store. Yes. And so we've known each other for 
almost 18 years now. Is it and at least? Uh, yeah, yeah, maybe it, even more. I haven't counted in a while. <laughs> We're getting old. Yeah, yeah. It is kind of funny how the John's years getting have, old. Uh, by. Especially the last few years, it's amazing. Uh, yeah. Our time domain has been a little bit whack, so. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, for sure. I've known Andy Payer for a long time, not as long as Josh, but yeah. it really is a unique product and a very special product. And for me, I saw the opportunity as you know, it was always very underexposed, intentionally so. You know, yep. Andy, he always had more orders than he could fill. So he didn't, and he didn't want to make a big company. He always wanted to keep it small. So the opportunity to, to make Rockport a little bit bigger and get and have a little bit more eyes on it was really exciting to me because I think it really deserves the recognition in the marketplace. It, it, it's, it's the real deal. Well, I think you're having an effect on that. <laughs> well, I'm trying so to. I just, well, I just I, want to let yeah. you know that I, I, I think you're being successful in what your uh, goal was. He certainly that. is. Yeah. And, and you know, director of sales is the title you have, but you're also very much marketing and also uh, very much a collaborator on all of the deci decisions in the company. Well, I've noticed today um, and yesterday, um, seeing you all work together and that kind of thing was kind of a very unique working relationship. So yes. it's great to be able to see that within you all. Um, you said you played an instrument. Yes. What, uh, what did you uh, play? Uh, trumpet. Somebody in uh, fourth grade gave me a trumpet. So I picked it up and I, I tend to be, I tend to stick to things. So I uh, played it for the rest of my life. One of the things just personally for me in my life, uh, recently I've had an opportunity to get into a lot of studios and actually hear some of those things actually back on, on a record or that yeah. kind of thing. It's been really unique for me because it's kind of raised my awareness of kind of what is kind of present and live and real and that yeah. kind of thing. And I love this because there's, there's no end of the learning curve in this industry and we learn that because we keep thinking it'll never get better, but you guys constantly find ways to make it better. And we find ways to work with gear to help make it better too. So there's better value as we work with companies and that kind of thing as well. So tell us a little bit about just uh, generally, just a little bit of music that you like, if y'all don't mind just sharing that with folks. Just inspired. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I, I hate that question, not hate, <laughs> well, it's a strong <laughs> word. What's your favorite type of the music is the question I, I don't like, because I'm a little bit all over the place. But, How about um, just a couple of three no, songs? No, I'll give you, here. but okay. classical and jazz are, are most, and eclectic music are what I listen to, but I really love 20th century classical music. I love uh, basically all the jazz from the cool jazz period on up. Mm -hmm. And um, kind of uh, hard not to. I'm yeah, there's... but uh, but honestly, I like everything. I like country music. I like rap. I like folk music. So I can't. I'm sorry. I can't be more specific. Then that's okay. I, I refuse. I think to be... most of us that I've found in the industry will like and listen to anything that's well done. And for me, and turn new music turns me on. Hearing new performances, even if they don't quite work, is really, really fun for me. And you need so classical music, for example, I love hearing new performances of the same works or different works. It's amazing to me that I, you know, I, one of the things in my brain that kind of goes off whenever I think about symphonies is just the kind of a brain that it takes to create yeah, yeah. that. And when we look at that, and then you think about the brains that it takes to create a speaker or an amplifier, or all the people involved to be able to bring this kind of thing back to us is, yeah. yes. it's an amazing feat. I mean, yeah. it really is. It's not an easy thing to do. And I just, anyway, I admire those that are always, what I call, have the passion to push it farther. Yeah. yeah. And to your point about the studio, you know, the recording art, the people working, producing, recording, engineering, our artists also. Mm -hmm. we, we're excited about a system that conveys what the artists put together with their team. So, you know, obviously they wrote, they wrote the music, they're playing it. Maybe they didn't write the music, but they're playing it. And the engineering team is part of that sound. We want to have a, a speaker that conveys that experience, what they put together, whether it's that space in a recording venue or that that studio mix, that guitar sound, that vocal sound with the mic that they picked. Mm -hmm. And all that stuff is, that's what gets you closer to the artist when you can't actually go live and hear that artist. What I love about what you just said is something I've kind of taught for a while and I'm gonna walk on eggshells here for a minute. <laughs> but we always get told about their mic preferences. So yeah. I want the system to sound like this. Right, right. And one of the biggest problems with that is we sometimes keep ourselves from getting to the artist. Right. And it doesn't mean that rooms don't need 
sometimes some help and equalization and that kind of thing for two different recordings and that kind of stuff. But what we wanted to make sure of is that we are getting that because the only way that we end up getting the chills on the end of our arms is to actually get what the artist is intending for us. That's right. And yeah. when there's the differences that they want to show to us and we can get that back out of the gear, that's when magic happens. And so I... I and to continue just one more thing, your artists in terms of working with your customers in terms and how you put a system together because the system in the room, the components, the setup are a huge part of our per, per, speakers cannot perform if they're not put together cor correctly in a system and set up properly. It's always amazing as we learned yesterday and moving a speaker, I've always been amazed that you move it a quarter of an inch or a half inch yeah. or whatever and just kind of the things that can kind of come together and tear apart and that kind of stuff. And well, and that's one of the reasons why a dealer is so important because, yep. you know, we're selling a product whose ultimate performance is based on its position our, in the our, room. Our ability to and do it, our job. And, you know, Absolutely. a lot of customers don't realize that and, you know, they'll hunt for the speaker they think is great and they'll, they'll they'll get it into their room you know and they won't and it won't be great because they don't know how to set it up or they don't know that setup is required or they don't understand the complex interaction between speaker and room and a really great dealer brings that to the table they actually deliver install and spend hours setting up the speaker so that you can get what you're hearing in the store in your house and that's a vital part of the of our equation. I love the fact that you talk about it takes hours to set something yeah. up because it, we think normally we just kind of pop a speaker in a room and generally it goes in this place. We yeah. would all like to think. That. I, I would I would love it. I've you know one of the things I've studied a lot lately is waterfall plots and kind of what they show and how they create the interaction with the acoustics in the room and that kind of thing. And yeah. talking with a couple other speaker designers as well, it's kind of popped into my head. Yeah, and it's amazing uh, what goes on in some products out there and how difficult they can be to incorporate in a space or room. Um, without getting too much in the weeds. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you want to tell us a little bit about about music, yes. yeah, yeah, sure. So <laughs> we're, my, we're back to there. Oh, that, oh, that. <laughs> um, my my earliest like music. One of my earliest musical memories is my dad had a hi-fi system, mm -hmm. which I think you'll find a lot of people <laughs> in this industry. That's like a that's a common theme. You know, I don't think mm -hmm. I don't think I, I might not be here if that wasn't the case. You know, mm -hmm. he had a. I remember he had an NAD integrated amplifier and he had uh, 30, a 20 probably. Yeah, 30, 20 and a, a, <laughs> a, a B and O turntable mm -hmm. and a pair of speakers by a Canadian company that is long extinct called Camber. You know, I started with his records and he had like, you know, Ladysmith, Black Mombazo, Paul Simon, Van Morrison. And his the, dad's cool. And, and at the same time, <laughs> you know, I was getting into like 90s hip hop. So it was like, and like even very early hip hop, like, like the group called, like my first record was the Fat Boys. Oh, the album was called The Fat Boys Are Back. I mean, <laughs> awesome album. I can by see you, little kid, jumping around. It was like these three <laughs> yeah. um, and I totally broke my turn. That my dad's turntable, by the way, because I tried to scratch on the oh, the belt man. drive piano <laughs> turntable. Yeah. Didn't exactly go well. No, okay. no, no. He wasn't thrilled about that. But um, so that's kind of like where that's kind of the the melding, you know. And I, I I still love all that stuff and a lot of electronic music, like a lot of James Blakey kind of stuff and, okay but yeah it's a wide variety uh, but that's kind of the roots of it all nice thing uh, about it between the two of y'all you do cover yeah. a pretty large uh yeah uh, and he's got my classical music. covered we have a lot of overlap yeah we do yeah. actually i can yeah. see that yeah you know what i find too is when you have somebody else that you kind of admire obviously y'all admire each other yeah. and yes and you kind of okay why does he listen to this and it makes you kind of want to go well all right you take I, a real I, listen i want to pay yeah, attention yeah, exactly. because there's yep. something exactly. real here for me yeah. and that kind of thing as well totally. so that's totally. pretty awesome. Yeah. So let's let's uh, maybe get in a little bit of uh, kind of Rockport Technologies in general. Sure. So let's kind of, I guess, go through the line a little bit and yeah. kind of what the idea is behind the speakers or what the differences might be as we kind of go up and down the line. Sure, I'll take a stab at that and let John okay. also. We'll um, see if John will correct you. I'm but kidding. The, the way, well. <laughs> <I might. laughs> Just wait to hear what he said. <laughs> you will. The, the one thing that I would start with is that we are, you know, Andy Payor started the company and um, soldered and calibrated every speaker himself until I got there. I mean, we can't make speakers you know, for everyone. And our speakers are what I would call reference level. Even our smallest speaker is a, it has the best we can put into it. And really the only thing that it's lacking is size and 
maybe some of the cabinet complexity, mm -hmm. but we put the same work in calibration. And now Andy and I, for the last almost five years in parallel, calibrate every pair of, of crossover networks in front of the microphone. I do the soldering now. Now I'm pretty good at it. Uh, and, <laughs> it took uh, a while, and then so. our whole team, which is usually at least three of us, often four or five of us in the production side, include and John, who does help in production. Um, Many hats. <laughs> Uh, it's a we, small company. <laughs> we listen and verify because there are little things that are almost unmeasurable that we can hear. We're going to try to get each pair of atria, each Orion, which basically have the same frequency response curve, and it's very flat, but you can hear very subtle differences. So we listen as a team. Sometimes you have a bad day. Sometimes you're not focused. Mm -hmm. We all have to agree, basically, that this is correct. Okay. And so we do that process with every speaker, which really limits the number of speakers we can make. We're pretty committed to that. I think you know we will continue to broaden and hopefully advance our performance um, and certainly advance our performance per price, which is always a goal. But we're really reference quality products. Um, ultra high end, whatever you want to call it. Right. It seems um, like the smaller speakers for kind of a smaller room and the larger speakers for a larger room with some little bit of up and down. It's, it's a good regard. way to start. So, I mean, I think the, the easiest way for a customer to think about the line is, you know, we're, we're putting essentially the same driver technology and the same crossover technology into every speaker that we make. Right. What you're really paying for as you go up the line is a, I call it crazier and crazier cabinet. Because what we found is that when you, you might say more optimized, more optimized would be a better way to say it, perhaps. But good, crazy is kind good, of fun. Good job, I like boss. I like <laughs> way to lay it in there. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the 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 more optimized you can make the cabinet, um, the more you really just hear how good the drivers are and how well they can communicate the music and what's on the recording. And you really hear that as you go up go up the line. So you brought out Excellent. drivers, and I think it's a kind of a good segue yeah, sure. uh, kind of at this moment. Just kind yeah. of talk a little bit about drivers. Y'all have drivers that are pretty much pistonic. It's very hard to engineer a driver that is completely pistonic throughout the range that you're trying to use it. And what's so unique about Andy's designs is that they're they're pistonic way outside of the of where we actually even use it. Our mid-range driver, for example, goes all the way out to what five thousand. Which one? I mean, this one. Well, to our, about our thousand, right. which is yeah. a lower, bigger mid-range in our in our um, six-inch mid-range to sixty-five hundred. Right. Yeah. So before it starts to flex. Wow. Right. I mean, we have a lot of engineering into these products and we don't do it for fun. It's really expensive to make your own drivers completely from scratch. If we could buy it off the shelf and get this performance, I think there's no doubt that we would. We're a technology company, I would say, and John pointed this out. I, I will give him credit for that. Um, we're not wedded to one particular type of driver or one particular material, but we want to try to get the most accuracy. So back to Pistonic, that's, we feel the only way to get accuracy out of a driver and, and not have the colorations of that driver be, a, everything has some coloration. But we are trying to get the lowest possible noise, the lowest possible distortion, and the most accuracy, both frequency-wise, but also through the dynamic continuum, which is a, that's a harder thing to measure. You know, that goal might not be the goal of every loudspeaker manufacturer, and that's right. okay. I mean, if, if from your outset, you're not trying to do what we're trying to do, then I think yeah. you'd make a really good argument for using, you know, paper or some something that's not as stiff and light and is less pistonic. Because you can still build a good it's sound a, out of it. It depends Absolutely. on what your goal is. You know, our, right. we- I think a Victrola sounds really cool. I, I think so too. <laughs> in, in our experience, you know, what we think is really cool is if you if you take engineering as far as it can go and if you really reduce the noise level of the speaker system itself you're left with just the music and music is not fatiguing music is musical and actually and you get closer to it through engineering and that's really what rock force is about and we're, we're not always perfect we're not saying we're perfect right we're just trying to get right. to we're trying to reveal what the artists put together that's one of the things I loved about, um, you commented on it earlier, but it's yeah. something you said yesterday and you've said to me before, okay. and it was about your company is open enough to accept a new technology and being yeah. able to, to adopt to it very easily and quickly because you haven't invested so much money in this, yeah. that, in or the other to kind of strap yeah. you to using those materials. Yeah. And some could that say that's well a, said. That's I, absolutely it, well okay. said. And it's at the core, it's at the core of, of who Rockboard is. And I think it's a, a key differentiator and, and it kind of, 
it's a fun thing. You know, we if there's a better way to do something, we want to be able to pivot. Okay. And and so we try and keep as much of the, the hard manufacturing out of house as possible. You know, we don't want to be molding rubber surrounds in house. Right. You know, there's people that are really good at doing that. We'll let them do it. They can ship us the parts. What we're really good at is research and development, um, design and precision assembly and calibration. That's where we want our time to go. But yep. we're not an economies of scale company. Right. We're not, and because of that, yep. you know, we're we're always going to be expensive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as Andy would put it, you know, we're not only slow, we're expensive. <laughs> 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 or actually, I got yeah. it wrong. It would say, we're not only expensive, no, yeah, but, yeah, we're yeah, but we're slow. Yeah, yeah. 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 I always like that one. You I got the point it. across. <laughs> right. yeah. Well, listen, kind of while we're still on drivers, let's yes. talk a little bit about sure. it. We've got a couple of samples over here. Sure. Pulling one, uh, yeah, yeah. one or two out, just kind of showing us a little bit about how that is. We're going to leave yeah. the Orion for the end. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So we'll go through that completely there. Yeah, so uh, like for this speaker, Orion, I mean, we will talk about Orion because I have okay. the parts. All right, cool. You know, this was a, a three driver three way. So in this case, we needed bigger drivers to meet our dynamic goals. You can make a three driver three way that is relatively full range in frequency response, but might not play in dynamic response. I'm going to go X, <laughs> okay. X, Y kind of okay. And um, so you need bigger drivers, we felt, to do an ultimate level speaker that would really convey musical dynamics. There wasn't a 31 millimeter beryllium dome available, which we would have used if we could have bought one. So we made our own tooling and it took a long, long time to make these domes and they're crazy expensive, but they achieve our goal. So. That's one piece. So we made a tweeter that's a little bit larger so that we can get more dynamics out of it. Essentially, so, at the low end. So what a lot of manufacturers will do is add another driver. So what are the advantages of doing it this way versus that way? We all like the way well, a what... point source sounds. And you know, and a three-way, three driver, three-way is the most pure expression of a point source that we can make. So especially the mid-range and tweeter, you're, you're dealing with massive differences in wavelengths from roughly 56 feet long in the lowest base to less than a quarter of an inch in the highest treble. So in the mid-range and tweeter, ideally you would have those concentric or have one driver that does the whole thing, but there are massive limitations to that. So in our design, we have the mid-range and tweeter as close as they possibly can be and crossed over very, very carefully so that their dispersion characteristics are very even, not just with the front direct uh, radiating sound, but also with the side radiating sound so that the stuff coming off your walls and ceilings and floor consistent. is consistent. Andy couldn't get the performance he was looking for out of off the shelf components. So we went, you know, we wanted a cone, mid-range cones are the hardest. Yes. And we wanted the lightest possible, but relatively big again, because it's not a problem driving 2000 Hertz or 1000 Hertz. Any, even a nice four inch or three inch mid-range will do that. The problem is we want to drive 150 Hertz and 200 Hertz, much longer wavelengths. Mm -hmm. We need a bigger cone because as the wavelengths get longer, the cone loses traction with the air. It's like spinning your tires. It's yeah. not pushing the air properly. So that's why we make all of our own driver parts. Just to say something about the Orion real quick, even though we're gonna get onto it a little bit later, it is an extremely small speaker yeah. for its friggin' powerful capabilities. Yeah. That was, is, the goal. that was the goal. That's kind of, I mean, it's it sits in my wheelhouse. I've yeah. never liked these. We things. really wanted something that you could get into more like normal living spaces. You know, like you can definitely- a little bit more normal in a yeah. normal living <laughs> I mean, space. Yeah, totally. I, I mean, <laughs> you, can, you can put this in, in, in the sound room or in the man cave for sure, and people do. But absolutely. you can also put them in a the living room. And you could argue all of our speakers are, are yeah, that way. Absolutely. Yep. Keep going. Yeah. Can you go through how maybe one of the drivers is made? I know you yeah, used the sure. Rojo cell and Yeah. I mean, and it's hard to show in this kind of video, but what we're making is a sandwich composite. So okay. skin skin core skin. It's like an airplane wing or um, um, I I-beam. I beam. Okay. So we're using a really stiff skin that's also very light. So we use the current best 
uh, carbon fiber you can buy, which is a spread toe, meaning instead of round threads, they're flattened threads, which means there's less weaving, which means there's less st stretching and less weight. And this mid-range cone, I didn't bring this mid-range, but it's very similar. This has many, many layers of material, but it's very, very thin. Um, this six inch mid-range, which is in most of our drivers, weighs about seven and a half grams. Um, very, very light, but it doesn't bend or flex at all in the operating range, and in fact, way above the operating range. To make a part like that is extremely expensive, and um, obviously it's gotta do the job, we think it does. To get to this, we have to actually start with raw carbon fiber fabric, pre-preg it, which is put, putting the glue in before you mold it, okay. at the, just enough to make it fully wet when you melt it, no more because resin is very heavy. Then we use the Roacel, which you mentioned, which is a structural foam that is very stiff, but very, very light. And that's what's creating the section thickness. And the point to get back to the I-beam section or the beam section mm -hmm. is if you have two stiff skins and a section between them, they act as a sy system that becomes very hard to deflect to okay. bend. And by having a section, you're you're putting the skins in tension. They have to stretch each other to bend for the whole part to flex. Mm -hmm. and, and generally speaking, the bigger the section, the, the stiffer it becomes. We did that because we couldn't achieve the result we wanted without going that far. And this is our, in big terms, second generation sandwich composite cone. So what are the differences as you go from like the Atria 2 to the next one up the line? So focusing on the cabinet, the Atria 2 has a four inch thick constraint layer damped baffle. Mm. The AVR2 has a six inch thick constraint layer damped baffle. The AVR2 has more internal bracing. Of course, it's a larger speaker, so it's got right. more internal volume. The driver complement is very similar, except for the AVR2 has an, has a, an additional nine inch base woofer. So it's a little bit more extended in the base. Um, it can play louder and lower. Um, and you're he and it's quieter because the cabinet is more robust. Right. It's amazing yep. what a cabinet does for the quietness of a speaker. And it, you know, and, and yet you can have noise across crossovers, you can have noise across drivers, but holy smokes, when you put a cabinet together like what these, these, I just. Trust me, we wouldn't do it if, if it didn't work because right. it's, it's hard and you end up with a, you know. It takes a really <laughs> long time. No, Cygnus, yes. um, uh, yeah. I know that we've got one of the. Yeah, I'll pick that up. Behind. So Cygnus is, you know, similar in construction to, you know, Atria 2 or Avior 2, except we've done kind of a hybrid here. So um, Lyra is using cast aluminum. Orion is using cast aluminum. We wanted to incorporate aluminum into a lower level product, but keep the price down, but give you a lot of performance. So we focused on the baffle. The baffle is a great place to focus on because it's where the drivers actually mount on into the speaker cabinet. Right. The stiffer it is, the more well damped it is. It's just a perfect surface for the piston to work. Because, because what I think is missed a lot of times is people don't really realize that that tweeter moves just a tiny little bit. Right. And if that cabinet is being moved by the woofer at all, yeah. we're either losing detail or adding noise one way or the other constantly. 100%. So what we did with Cygnus to add to add some of the Lyra or Orion-like performance is we did a constrained layer damped aluminum sub baffle. So this is two um, three quarter inch thick pieces of machine aluminum that have a viscoelastic layer between them. So it's fully damped, you know, this is- What is the dampening necessary for? Well, because aluminum on its own rings like a bell. So and if you had a driver just screwed to it without any dampening and it's going back it, and forth- It would not it make... sound good. No, it'd be very okay. fatiguing. You would, yeah. It's... You're gonna get a lot of bell. You're gonna okay. get a lot of ringing. Okay. So, but you can no tell- No more cowbell. You would no, have some nice... No more cowbell. You would have some, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a different kind of cowbell. <laughs> <laughs> and you would get more. This gives you all the stiff, the, the stiffness that you want at a much lower price point than a product like Lyra, our flagship, which is, you know, $205,000. Right. You know, Cygnus is $70,000, but it's a very high value product. Well, a lot of the benefit comes from this. Yeah. But the other quick thing I would want to add is the products that Andy made 30 years ago, if you put them in this system, they would, ha would not have the resolution, but they would have the musicality 
musicality can be a bad word. To me, it's not. It's mm -hmm. about realism. Mm -hmm. And um, certainly the tonality. The tone, they have not quite as much dynamics. They don't have quite as much information, but there's nothing wrong with a 30 year old rock board. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with a 20 year old rock board. We build every product as if it was the last product we would want to own. Uh, John and I both use Atria, actually, and Andy use Atria at home. So, I guess it is time to talk about kind of the two top level speakers. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So you have one that's been out there a while, which is Lyra. Yes. Okay. And then we have a brand new speaker. So we're going to talk about probably the brand new speaker sure. first. Sure. Um, since we've kind of started at the bottom and going up. It must have been amazing to dream of this speaker and look at this in a very different way than everybody else has. Because this is a really unique speaker in this marketplace, right? Uh I don't know of another three-way that has the dynamic capabilities of what this is doing well, in this world. Absolutely. And, and not just dynamics, but I mean... It. Yeah. And I think, you know, really, you know, we were kind of bucking the trend a little bit and it, there was a little bit of nerves, you know, from a sales perspective, because when you're making a speaker at this level that is this small and that only has three drivers, mm -hmm. the immediate perception is, well, where's where's the money going? And also, when it's fully assembled and painted, you know, you can't really tell what's on the end. It kind of looks like a speaker from the outside. You can't see the cast aluminum, you know, one piece on the inside or the dual carbon fiber outers or the, you know, you know, 150 pounds of viscoelastic between them. You, you can't see any of that stuff. There's no bells and whistles on the outside that give you a, you know, that cue you into where the money is going. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, there was a little bit of like trepidation there, but you know, we decided to really just kind of go, go stick with our guns and go where our hearts were mm -hmm. because we both, we all really enjoyed the sound of a three-way, three-driver speaker, and we wanted to get it into more places. That's really good. Yeah, that's that's what Orion's all about. I was gonna say, well said. <laughs> I mean, really, I, <laughs> you no, know. stop. <laughs> the, only, the only little thing I would add, yeah. I, I don't have anything to add yeah. to that, but you know, Andy did his first beam section cabinet in 1991 with yes. the first product, ProScion. Wow. Yeah. That was a dual monocoque inner uh, fiberglass <laughs> shell outer fiberglass shell, section thick and thickness between them. Yeah. In this case, we're not trying to make a light composite. We actually want mass. You want the inertial reference mm -hmm. so the drivers don't push the cabinet, basically. Right. So that was fiberglass, fiberglass, viscoelastic damping core, which is doing two things. It's creating the section thickness for the beam section. Okay. And it's damping, damping. those materials. Mm -hmm. um, and giving you mass. So but, let's talk a little bit about that. What are the three things that are required in yeah. a cabinet that really have to be maximized to have a really, really quiet cabinet. Quiet cabinet would be mass, okay. damping, yes. and stiffness. Yes. And and you don't get all three of those things in a monolithic construction from a monolithic material. If you build a cabinet just out of aluminum, out of one thing, out of a monolithic thing, you can get stiffness, you can potentially get mass depending on how thick the aluminum is, but you're not, you're gonna have that damping issue. You're gonna have to find some, some damping. And if you do damp it, now you're really, that's a composite. That's why composites are so important. You know, in order to get stiffness, mass and damping, you can't just use one thing. In the case of Orion, we're using aluminum, a viscoelastic damping core material and carbon fiber. In the case of Lyra, we're using two cast aluminum shelves and a viscoelastic, but it's a composite system because you need all three of those things. And just quickly to add one thing, shape is super important. Yeah. And you can't make every material go into an ideal shape like that. And if right. you look at the step between Orion and Cygnus. Cygnus is faceted yeah. because that's using flat panel material that we are very artfully and very um, painstakingly creating into a good shape for upper frequency and low frequency dispersion. Okay. This is the shape you want to okay. have a pure sounding speaker where the cabinet's diffraction effects are not greatly contributing to the sound of the driver. And by diffraction, we're talking about, you know, sound radiates in 360 degrees. Mm -hmm. And when that sound hits the cabinet, if you have a cabinet that has sharp edges, it kind of breaks off those edges and it breaks off out of phase and out of time with the signal that's coming right at you. Right. So it creates a smear of, so, of, of kind. And cancellation. People don't realize the measurements, the tonal balance or the frequency response are not just coming from the driver, right. they're coming from the whole cabinet. 
That's why we use a high density damping wool on the front. And that's why we have these types of shapes because they perform better and, and more accurately in terms of minimizing the cabinet's contribution to the sound. So when you take mass stiffness and damping, which makes a quiet cabinet, but it's not gonna have a good shape necessarily. So right. and, and that's why a molded composite cabinet really takes it to the next level because when you're molding, you have complete control over the shape. You can do comp complex curvature that you can't do with flat panel construction, which is what most loudspeaker companies are, are making. It's the amazing because, you know, normally we see the charts with the speaker and it kind of drives like, you know, goes out like that. Yeah. Room, and yeah. We know that's not what it does at all because right. that air moves other air, which moves that air, which moves yeah. right on around. And, yeah, yeah. and the there are different ways to do it, but for in-room response, um, this is, we think, a really good way to get that you are there experience where you're conveying more of the recording space as opposed to the room you're in. Yeah. And quite honestly, it's beautiful. Yeah. Oh, that it just has such yeah, a yeah. such a very nice yeah. aesthetic look to it. Yeah. You can get it in any PPG paint color in the world. Yes, you can. Um, Doesn't even have to be PPG. And, and <laughs> get that. We had a hard time deciding on our color, as yeah, you yeah. know. Yeah. Um, but anyway, it was fun. We actually chose a Porsche GT silver metallic for it, which yeah. uh, turned out to we be also it. a speaker gorgeous. that y'all have actually done some of your photos yes. in and things. Yeah. yeah. That was not the reason for it. No. Uh, we're the home of Porsche here in Atlanta, and yeah. so. That was the reason that we did that. Atlanta, Germany. And uh, yes, Atlanta, Atlanta Germany. Germany. <laughs> you know, but uh, I must say it's come out absolutely beautiful. One of the things I, I come out, a lot of people talk about footers and spikes and all these kind of things and grounding things to the floor and how does that transmission happen and so on. So let's talk a little bit about Great. what you've done in this speaker and why. You know, first of all, this cabinet is self-damped. Yeah. You know, nothing's perfect. There is always gonna be some vibration, but we are trying to control the sound that the speaker is creating and other things could through the floor could potentially put into that cabinet that would cause it to vibrate and then resonate its own sound. So if the speaker is sitting on a suspended floor, mm -hmm. then you're kind of looking at it, the speaker is gonna excite the floor due to its pressure waves. Yes. And then come back and try to put something back up the speaker. Right, and it's and also that floor is gonna radiate. We can't really fix that. That is something that you might fix right? for your customers. Of course. Um, and sometimes it's easy. You can we've, put a lolly column in the basement. We've done that before. So, um, But <laughs> generally speaking, you want a stable, we want a stable platform for our speakers. Mm -hmm. You could do full on isolation, but that's very tricky to do where isolation, it has to be tuned for every frequency. Back to what we do, having a solid foundation, a solid connection to the floor and holding the speaker still so it doesn't vibrate and move with the music. You can't control the floor, but at least you can connect solidly to it. And this product we offer uh, disc feet because this is a 360 pound speaker. And if you put a spike, you're getting tens of thousands of pounds of pressure. of pressure per square inch at that point. And it might wind and up in the basement. It will drill into your floor, right. depending on what it's made out of. We also offer spikes for the speaker, which you may not know. I don't yeah. know. So yeah. we can change that out, yeah. but with our higher mass speakers, you will see these disc feet, yeah. which are only really making contact around the outer ring. So okay. they somewhat saw that. act yes. like a spike, mm -hmm. but don't mess up your floor. This footer works really well with most so I've been amazed how easy it was to work with, uh, yeah. how easy it was to level. Yes. Um, even though you, it's very hard to level a product that has no flat surfaces. Yes. Um, right. Except on the bottom of the speaker. Laser level. Sure. So thank you very yeah. much for that. <laughs> yeah. um, it saved me a lot of yeah. time trying to figure that one out. <laughs> and also the feet lock. So once you have them level, mm. uh, we have a lock knob on these higher level products where that is locked in, into place and becomes rigid like the rest so you system. have an absolute concrete block sitting on top of concrete. And lastly, yes. to your point about the floor, which it does redirect energy into the speaker, it's a two-way street. Mm -hmm. um, the cabinet can handle that vibrational energy um, because those feet are rigidly attached to this structure, which is very, very well self-damped by its viscoelastic. Viscoelastics, yes. we've done them in many ways, but there are lots, rubber is a great example of, of mm -hmm. a material that feels like a viscoelastic. In this case, we're using a much harder, soft material. Flexible material is okay. really the right word. And you're trying to create hysteresis, which is actually the memory of the material. If you push it, it comes back to where it was. Yeah. And so 
This material is really hard to push, but that matches the mechanical impedance of the aluminum, especially okay. much better. And so, and it's like uh, digital cables. If you have an impedance mismatch, mm -hmm. you get a reflection of the signal. Yep. With vibrational energy, if you have a, a mechanical impedance mismatch where you go into a really soft rubbery material from a really hard material like aluminum, the energy just reflects off the rubber. It doesn't uh, get absorbed. I was never aware of that. That's cool. That's interesting. <laughs> so our viscoelastics are custom designed chemistry for each product we make with them. Wow. And that because includes- Because each of the substructures that you're using are different, so therefore it has to be different. The glue we the use in, works with that. in the okay. Atria and Avior is different from the viscoelastic in the Cygnus um, constrained mode aluminum baffle. This is different from the viscoelastic used in the Orion, hmm. which is has carbon fiber and aluminum, and is different from the viscoelastic used in the Lyra, which is aluminum and aluminum. So even though we have some similarities in the driver, everything else is different. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, yeah. yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty neat. I mean, yeah. I, you know, again, until you have these discussions, you don't really realize sometimes the variances of things that are needed yep. and what is required. And, and from an engineering standpoint, this shows, I mean, again, just great prowess over what you're what you're doing and recognition of, you know, the things that are necessary to be known. And when you think about Andy and his uh, expertise kind of from the 90s. And Andy, by the way, is an electrical engineer, but so, honestly, I think he's, <clears throat> as a mechanical engineer and designer, um, amazing. And yeah. uh, But the cool thing about speakers and what's always appealed to me, and I bet John, is that it's, it's all these things. It's mechanical, it's electrical, it's acoustic. It has all the... You gotta be good at a lot of different things mm -hmm. to get that. And the more and more I become in tune with kind of, you know, the speaker and what it's done and, and the dynamics uh, ability of it. And it's kind of a one of a kind speaker and yes. congratulations to you guys for doing so. So let's talk about one last detail and that's sure. um, pretty much in crossovers and that kind of thing. You mentioned Great. a little yeah. bit about it. So let's talk about the crossover and what you do because consistency of manufacturing and everything. And I'm sorry, we haven't really talked about the cabinet yet in it. It's no, okay. okay. In, in we, that regard. Yeah, yeah. So we have, there, and but. by the way, we have great videos yeah. um, because it, you don't see what's on the inside. Right. So we actually did a video that shows literally how it's built. I've seen that. It's, yeah. it's on our YouTube yeah. page. You can link it from our website. Yeah, yeah. And by the way, everybody, you'll geek out over that one, yeah. so go find it. So that's a better way, because and Andy is the, uh, is He's the, the narrator. narrator of that. Yeah. So yeah. fantastic. Um, yeah. That's the way to hear it, yeah. honestly. Okay. Yeah. All right, fair enough. Yeah. But the crossover. So first of all, we, we match our drivers multiple times each. Um, so they're within a very, very tight window. And unfortunately, we have to reject a fair amount that don't fall in the window. So the drivers are matched, first, first of all. The crossover components are matched to any degree that they would have a measurable effect on the signal. We take that out of the equation. We're not doing a different crossover for every speaker. We are calibrating that same crossover for every individual group of drivers because um, Drivers vary a little bit, especially outside of their normal operating band. So okay. mid-ranges that are matched, let's call this the mid-range, okay. uh, they're gonna be very even within that mid-range, but when you get off to their upper and lower parts, they get more variable. We dial in those nodes and there are uh, usually 10 or 12 select on test nodes that we are dialing in. So for example, with inductors, which are just coils of wire, mm -hmm. we build our coils with more turns on them so that we can take turns off down to the point where it's just right. And with capacitors, because you can add them in parallel, we can we put our capacitance slightly low so we can bring it up to the ideal value. It's an iterative process, like setting up a turntable. You change one thing and it changes the other things. Yeah. So in addition to this calibration, after the calibration is done, we listen to every pair as a group, not just one of us. Wow. The key differentiator here from other manufacturers is that you know, the crossover from the get-go is designed to be adjusted during the build process. Okay. You know, that's kind of the key thing to Good if you pull back to understand is that most other crossovers, what they do is they design the loudspeaker, they design the drive, you know, they, they say, okay, I'm gonna use these drivers, here's what the crossover is gonna be, and then they make a bunch of crossovers in mass using PC boards. Those values cannot be changed. Circuit boards, yeah. Circuit boards, right? Mm -hmm. And the assembly 
early process is you put the drivers in, in the box and you wire the drivers to the crossover mm -hmm. and you ship the product. Well, measure it maybe. Maybe, hopefully measure it, right? But because there's variations in the drivers in every one of those boxes, but the crossover stays the same, each pair will sound slightly different. Right. So Which is okay in, in lower level products. Absolutely. I mean, you can't spend the time to do this. Right. But what we do is we make a crossover that can be adjusted during the build process. And it's but, intentionally done that way so that you can reach uh, this ultimate yeah. You know, result. Yeah, it's hard to make circuit boards sound as good. You can, but we do right. point to point wiring um, which allows us to do the adjustment, but it also sounds better. Um, but it's more labor intensive. You know, we spend just as much time doing this process to a pair of Atria 2s as we do with the Lyra. So, mm -hmm. and we really do. So the same <laughs> costs are associated throughout the line in that regard. 100%. Therefore, yeah. You know, I mean, somebody buying your smallest <laughs> speaker, yeah. um, you know, gets everything that they deserve from we've listened, technology. We've listened to that pair. All of us have listened to that pair that you mm -hmm. get, that Atria 2. That's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. And Andy and his, at least 40 years of experience with speakers and microphones is looking at every pair. Yeah. And now I am looking at every pair for the last five years. Okay. So we, there's a lot of, you're getting a lot of Rockport when, the experience of Rockport when you buy the product. You know, the experience of the people in Rockport. Right. Okay. I'm just so proud of y'all and, and your company for being brave enough to uh, do this type of thing. It's right up my alley. <laughs> wow, I don't well, like to be the exact same thing as everyone, but that's yeah. not why I would choose a product like this. Yeah. I chose your company and you guys. Yeah. And the reason for that is culture. Yep. And it's, um, you know, I, I want to work with companies that are fun to work with, but serious about going places and people that will help nurture our business and our customers and us nurture their business and them. Yep. And so I, I just want to say that I, I'm really happy to have y'all here because y'all really fit our culture spec very, very well. Thank you. We We're, feel that way. And, you know, Andy, I know feels that way. Also, you know, this, I had a small part in this design, but this has grown out of all the things that he's done over the years. And, and we appreciate that you appreciate the simplicity approach because we think that's a fun, it's not perfect for every situation, but it, right. it really can work well. We do not exist without our dealer network. Right. And we don't have a lot of dealers because there aren't a lot of places in the country where you can come experience systems at this level with people that have the expertise and the knowledge of this type of product. I think that's important to highlight that, you know, we we are not, Rockport is not in the world without a Hi-Fi Buys. We're together. Yeah. Yes, I mean, absolutely. That's, that's and that's true like. worldwide. But I have to tell you, I haven't felt that way with every manufacturer. And it's sure. something that I very sure. much love, the togetherness and that sure. kind of thing. And I think that a customer that's out there looking at things, yeah. they want to know that the company is serious. They yeah. want to know the company can take them, not only from this point, but many years down the road. Yeah. That if their product has a problem, or if you come out yes. with a new one, yeah. are you going to lend yourselves to them and to the dealer to help you know, That's come right. over that? These days, manufacturers have a direct line to, you know, or excuse me, consumers have a direct line to a manufacturer regardless. Right. And I always love it when my manufacturers kind of direct things back to us. There sure. are things that we can't answer that obviously, That's and right. I'm always willing to go find that answer as opposed to just, you know, tell them whatever. And I just like the kind of, you know, the, the working with one another and to helping, helping a consumer feel comfortable yeah. to part with his hard earned dollars for yeah. a yep. legitimately luxury product. And well, by the way, Rockport products on the used market have incredibly high resale value because there's we, not many of them out there. No. There aren't many because no. people don't sell them and they pass them on, but but uh, we still still service and support through our dealer network our 30-year-old plus products, and we will as long as we possibly can, but um, again, we can't do that without our dealers. Yep. So, well, thank you. That's definitely our way of doing business. Do y'all have anything that you want to just tell the folks out there? Um, I, mean, I mean, I would just say, you know, if, if you're in the Atlanta area, Make a point of coming down here and getting getting your butt in this seat and in all the other seats they have in the store yeah. because it's they're really unfortunately there are just not that many stores like this in the United States and we are so proud to yeah. be here and it's a special experience when you come in here and you know these guys really care about what you walk out with and delivering a musically satisfying system and the experts that are working in the store are really special people that really know what they're talking about so yep take advantage of it come here. Awesome. 
Thanks oh. so much for your time. Yeah, thank yes. you, Alan. Thanks for having thank us. Thank you all very much for being here. Yeah. Uh, you are a blessing to us. Thank uh, you, and I mean that we're... sincerely. To you folks out there, uh, Josh Clark and John Zimmer with Rockport Technologies. This is Alan Jones with Hi-Fi Buys. We're out. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, Alan.